Our main presenter this week is a member of our own commu community. Dr. Richard Andrews has been a part of Oasis for many years. Uh, he's given many good presentations in the past. This one's actually a follow-up from a great one he did about a year ago. Please join me in welcoming Richard Andrews. Um, can, am I on? Okay, can you guys hear me all right? So, okay, so uh, buckle your seat belts. Oh, okay. How's that, a little better? Okay, great, thank you. So, uh, I'm so wired up this morning, I have another wire also, so I feel like an undercover cop, <laughs> which is appropriate to the topic, I suppose. And uh, so we're going to do a little bit of uh, a quick survey here as part of our uh, scientific endeavor. Uh, raise your hand if in the last week, including today, you've had two or more caffeinated beverages. Okay. So I'd say that looks like about 80% of the audience. Okay. And raise your hand if you've ever eaten a poppy seed bagel or a poppy seed muffin. So that's a good 60%, I would say. Okay. Uh, and in, uh, in, in a case of more or less full disclosure, uh, we may or may not have put something into the coffee this morning as an experiment. Uh, it's, it's a fast-acting volatile substance. Uh, and uh, don't worry if you didn't drink the coffee this morning. Because it's so volatile, if you're within a meter and a half to two meters of somebody who did drink it, then at any point during the presentation, if you find yourself giggling, then we'll call that a positive uh, influence. Uh, so I will have no humor during the talk in order to do a proper experiment. <clears throat> I know it when I see it. This was actually part of the language of a famous uh, 1964, famous if you're as old as I am, uh, a 1964 Supreme Court uh, decision. It was right in the decision in the legal language and they were looking at a film and they were trying to decide if it met the standard of being hardcore pornography or not. Uh, the Supreme Court decided that it did not, but what was fascinating was the more or less intellectual discussion that went on in connection with that and the legal discussion. Uh, and they brought in all kinds of experts from both sides and they really had a surprising amount of difficulty uh, defining hardcore pornography. Uh, and it's similar with the word addiction, I would say. And actually, to a certain extent, there's movement away from the word addiction and definitely away from the word addict as being unnecessarily stigmatizing and not particularly helpful. <clears throat> so, some more on the language of addiction and addict. <clears throat> the original meaning from the Latin, now the word addiction and its, and its uh, affiliated words uh, had various different meanings, but the one that's relevant here is that it referred to as an adjective, actually, not a noun, <clears throat> and it referred to somebody who was a slave, uh, including from uh, debt. If you were indebted to somebody and couldn't pay your bills, you would sometimes be made into a slave uh, for that person. Uh, and it wasn't really used with reference to substance addiction until the 1700s, at least in the English language. Um, earlier than that, in the 1500s, it was used with regard to being very devoted, even obsessively devoted to something, but not substances. Sometimes the purists today will say, uh, the language purists will say, you know, why are you using it to refer to your cell phone and so on and so forth? You know, why don't we stick with just the original meaning? But the original meaning wasn't substances, actually. So. Uh, and there's uh, an older term, IVDA, which stands for intravenous drug abuser, but we're also getting away from the word abuse. Now, you'll still see that term a lot somewhere, but that also tends to be stigmatizing and not particularly helpful, and it comes from a sort of a moralistic place. Now, the less stigmatizing term, uh, intravenous drug user, is used, or drug user in general, uh, and what was fascinating, some of you have heard me talk about my trips to Portugal to look at their remarkable approach to all this. Uh, and the conferences I've been to dealing with substance use, uh, drug use that is, and hepatitis, at these conferences, the community is represented by 
members of the current or former drug-using community, and they regard themselves as a community, and they care about each other, and they're not suicidal, uh, and it's just a fascinating approach. And surprise, surprise, it turns out that people who have substance use issues, substance use disorder, which we'll define in a minute, <clears throat> turns out they're actually normal people. You know, they have issues like we all have issues. Uh, it's funny, when I was a kid, I used to think my family was unusually normal. And I would look around at other families that had dysfunction. Um, that was before I learned certain things about my family. <laughs> that made me, made me realize that we were just as dysfunctional as anybody else, uh, or at least just as neurotic, maybe not dysfunctional necessarily. Um, so is caffeine addictive? This is kind of an interesting question, especially since many of us are consuming or have consumed caffeine this morning. Uh, and the scientific articles seem conflicted about this. It is widely regarded as the most popular psychoactive substance in the world. Psychoactive, of course, meaning that when you consume it, it changes something in your brain and can change your behavior, whether it makes you more alert or agitated, or as some bumper stickers say, do uh, stupid things faster and with more energy, you know. Um, and it strikes me as being similar to circumcision articles. Uh, and I'm, I'm more or less serious about this. In other words, uh, when people argue about circumcision, I think it would uh, help the reader of the article, uh, this is for a male circumcision, um, if, the, if it was a male author, I think they should divulge whether they are circumcised or not, because you can't really interpret their scientific opinion until you know whether they're circumcised or not, it seems to me. Uh, and caffeine is recognized as affecting the same parts of the brain as cocaine, uh, but the articles are funny because they say, well, it affects the same part of the brain, but, but in a different way, you know, in a different way, because um, we're not like the other person after all. Uh, and why don't we discuss this topic over coffee, you know, yeah. Uh, so addiction is usually defined as what the other person is using, not, not what I'm using. Kind of like the expression, uh, you know, anybody who drives slower than I do is an idiot, and anybody who drives faster than I do is a maniac, right? It's the same idea. So one of the definitions, because again, this is actually kind of a tricky definition, one of the definitions of addiction is that it's a chronic relapsing brain disease with compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. Now that's a key part of the definition, and typically that is, in fact, part of the definition. Uh, and so that kind of raises the interesting philosophical question. Uh, if you have compulsive drug use without harm, is that still an addiction? And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I have the answer to that. I, that's one thing, something that I'm trying to figure out also. Now, if you, sometimes it's highly contextual, though. You know, uh, whether something is harmful or not uh, is highly contextual. Whether you even are compulsively using it or not is highly contextual. Uh, and this has been shown uh, uh, extensively in the scientific literature, in fact. But if you're rich versus poor, are you more likely or less likely to have harmful consequences? Well, again, it depends on the circumstances, you know. Um, but I would say that in general, the poor are perhaps more likely to have harmful consequences. Um, and uh, in diabetes, is compulsive insulin injecting a disease? <laughs> you know, it's an interesting question. And uh, so now here is, uh, and I apologize for the slide being a little bit too busy and the letters are a little bit too small, but I'll, I'll review it. Um, so, uh, and you see in parentheses there, or, or perhaps you can see it, um, the older terms for, the, for these uh, phrases. In other words, loss of control. There are three different categories. Loss of control, uh, physiology, the effects on the body, in other words, and consequences. Those are the three areas in which you may have, uh, you know, you can describe certain things about the person uh, uh, who has come to you for assistance with this. They are using more drug than they intended. They're unable to cut down, uh, giving up certain activities that they used to enjoy, craving uh, on, the, on the physiology side, uh, experiencing tolerance. Now, tolerance, unlike the tolerance here at Houston Oasis, in this case, tolerance 
refers to the need to increase your dose of the substance in order to keep experiencing what you were experiencing before. This is a, a natural phenomenon with, uh, with some drugs and with some people. Uh, even with opioids, it, it does not occur universally. Sometimes it occurs and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I've, um, you know, one of the most common reasons people go to doctors is for pain of one kind or another. Uh, and there are various different ways to approach pain. Uh, I like to start with what are called non-pharmacologic approaches, which is to say, are you getting enough sleep? You need to get some more exercise, issues like that. Uh, and, um, but, you know, occasionally the most effective uh, medication to use is an opioid medication. And when used appropriately and monitored, they tend to be extremely safe. Uh, and I've had uh, a number of patients go for years at a time on the same exact dose of, of, a, of an opioid and never change the dose, and they do fine. And it's still helping with their pain. So unlike what you might hear, it is not the case that everybody has tolerance with opioids and with other medications. That simply isn't the case. Now, you do sometimes see that, especially in the case of euphoria, which is, of course, the most popular side effect. Uh, and then you have withdrawal in which you have the opposite effects on your body of the drug itself. When you're uh, withdrawing from the drug, you know, instead of feeling calm and having euphoria, you'll have the opposite of euphoria, which is called dysphoria, or in other words, feeling bad. Uh, instead of constipation with the drug, you'll have diarrhea. Uh, instead of feeling calm, you'll feel agitated. So that's withdrawal symptoms. And then on the side of consequences, you may have unfulfilled obligations, uh, interpersonal problems, uh, or find yourself in dangerous situations or having medical problems. The current definition then uh, of substance use disorder uh, is that you have two or more of the things listed and you feel distress or you have impairment. And all of those elements are important as part of the diagnosis. Um, so why does addiction happen? Well, as you might expect, this is a complicated story that is still uh, not all that well understood. Uh, but one of the ones that I wanted to focus on, because I think it's quite relevant and it's fascinating, uh, is adverse childhood experiences, uh, sometimes abbreviated, or the acronym is ACE. Uh, PTSD is sort of a, it can happen to an adult or a child. Uh, and, and it would tie in with the, at least for, for the childhood part, it would tie in with the ACEs uh, or even just a lack of positive experiences, especially in your formative years. Um, and there was a fascinating study done a number of years ago by people from the CDC together with uh, the Kaiser uh, group out in California where they collected data on a huge number of their uh, patients and they looked at certain things. You can take the study. Oh, by the way, anybody who uh, would like uh, to have a copy of the slides, you can email me uh, at sciencelover, sciencelover at gmail.com, and I'll send you uh, a copy of the, of the um, presentation. So uh, at that website, in fact, if you just Google uh, ACEs uh, test or ACE score, um, you'll be able to take the test and you'll get a score and then that may or may not correlate with, with certain issues. Uh, but if you had childhood trauma, neglect or abuse, an incarcerated parent, there's a whole variety of different things that uh, constitute adverse childhood experiences. And if you have a certain number of these and certain kinds of experiences, then that correlates quite well with certain problems, health problems that people develop including a risk of, uh, of addiction or substance use disorder. Um, a lower income all by itself uh, you know, can predict a higher ACE score. A higher ACE score predicts earlier drug use and more likelihood of having a substance use disorder. And uh, some studies indicate that a half to two-thirds of illicit drug use is explained by ACEs. Again, that would be problematic illicit drug use, not necessarily um, non-problematic. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of evidence-based policy. Now, there's a nice Wikipedia article on that. 
um, increasingly in medicine, and this did not used to be the case, increasingly in the medical field, if you don't present evidence for your position, your position is automatically deemed weaker. Um, now, sometimes good evidence doesn't exist for certain things. Uh, if good evidence doesn't exist, then sometimes you do have to fall back on other things like expert opinion. Um, uh, but it would be nice increasingly if we would have evidence-based policy. Um, for roughly a hundred years now, we've had um, prohibition against uh, drugs, you know, uh, and so, uh, and yet uh, drug use is not going down, problematic drug use is not going down, to put it mildly, uh, overdose deaths are rising, and so uh, despite a hundred years or more of prohibition against drugs, uh, the evidence suggests that it isn't working. Even proponents of prohibition admit that it isn't working, but they feel the solution is even more prohibition. So uh, I suggest that rather than having an emotional attachment to one view or another, we look at the evidence, uh, just like we do in the medical field, or at least the way we should. Uh, and should policemen, should cops be the ones who are dictating health and social policy? Again, I don't have a position one way or the other. We need to look at the evidence. And if the evidence suggested that that really was the best way to go, that putting drug users in jail for simple drug use, if that really was good, then I would be in favor of it. When I spoke to the Portuguese police about this when I was over there, because I tried to find people who disagreed with the policy, uh, and I, so I ended up talking to, I was able to arrange an interview with the top narcotics interdiction person in the country, uh, and he said, look, when this decriminalization law in Portugal first passed in 2001, I was opposed to it. A lot of my police colleagues were opposed to it. Um, but at this point, uh, most of us support it. And he said, look, as a cop, I have to enforce whatever the legislature says the law is. I'm not the one who decides what the law is, that's what the legislature does. And he said, but I'm also a citizen. And as a citizen, as a member of the community, as a neighbor, I, I support the law because I have seen the benefits. And the cops, in other words, are frequently, uh, they frequently discover that they really aren't enjoying being the, you know, the drug police. You know, that in other words, um, and I'm not talking about drug dealing, I'm talking about drug using here, but, um, you know, they're really not well equipped to handle addiction and overdose and stuff like that. And so frequently police uh, appreciate no longer being in that realm. Uh, in, in Portugal, once you're deemed, if you're picked up with drugs in Portugal and in some other places, once they, once they determine, and they have criteria for this, once they determine that you're a user, not a dealer, then you're automatically shifted over to the health and social sector. Automatic. It's just automatic. There's no decision made. It's, all you have to do is decide user or not. If they're a user, they're automatically no longer a police issue. Uh, a brief history of drugs and money. Um, Mark Kurlansky, some of you may have read the books by Mark Kurlansky, uh, one called Salt and one called Cod. Uh, and I know that doesn't look relevant here, but the reason I bring those up is because uh, his perspective was to take a single topic and then view history through the lens of that topic. And it ends up being remarkably interesting uh, and so uh, I, I kind of see the same thing here with regard to drugs and economics or drugs and money. Uh, drug crops are always far more profitable than any other crop. And so when you're dealing with a number of poor farmers uh, and they have a choice between feeding their family or not, then uh, they're frequently going to choose the very profitable drug crop. Uh, I remember when I went to a tobacco museum at one of the tobacco companies in Virginia when I lived there, and I was fascinated to see uh, a comment there that in the Virginia colonies a few hundred years ago, you know, growing tobacco, because it was so profitable, uh, was so popular among the farmers that the colonies started to starve to death because no farmers were growing food. And so the Virginia governor had to pass, they had to pass a law saying that, that the farmers had to grow at least 5% of their territory for food crops. They had to set aside at least 5% for food crops. 
Uh, and, um, and then, you know, in the, in the uh, middle of the 1800s, of course, you had the opium wars, which are fascinating on so many different levels. But, uh, and that was England growing uh, opium in India in order to sell it to China. And then China saying, well, we don't think that's such a good idea for our population to have all this huge amount of opium coming in. Uh, and so the Chinese tried to restrict it. And the British said, no, 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 you can't restrict it. Uh, and so the, England went to war with China to force them to continue to import their Indian opium, you see. Uh, and that's, where, that's, why the, that's why Hong Kong was in British hands for all this time. That was part of the loot from winning the opium wars. That's why it was British. Uh, but what's, e what's interesting too, if you go back even further than that, the reason England felt like they had to grow uh, in, uh, opium in India and send it up to China was because England got addicted to another substance, which was tea, right? Uh, the British love tea, as you know, to this day. Uh, and that's mildly addictive. Uh, and so the, so, so the balance of payments with China was terrible. You know, so China was, I mean, England was buying all this tea from China, and so they decided to get another drug, and so the whole thing is interesting to me. So, and then a little bit more, I mean, if you look at the uh, stock market, you'll see all this, uh, you know, breathless discussion of the best stocks to buy and stuff like that, uh, including for the, uh, for the anti-overdose drug naloxone. There are a few different brands which we'll talk about here. Uh, drug treatment is a huge industry, uh, and then you have private prisons, of course. You know, one in five uh, Americans are incarcerated because of uh, drug use, uh, and, and there's been a huge increase in private prisons and private inmates uh, just in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, very briefly here, uh, I know I'm getting off track, is uh, the first documented hypodermic syringe use was uh, the guy who, who was the architect of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in London, who uh, apparently did a little bit of everything. And in the 1600s, he injected uh, dogs with opium using an animal bladder and goose feather quills. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you went to this guy as your doctor, uh, if you had to pay more for a clean bladder or, you know, or not, I'm not sure. And then shortly after that, the German scientists tried injecting various things into humans, and that didn't go very well. And so, uh, and since I grew up in Spain, I had to mention that the modern two-piece needle syringe combination was invented by a Spaniard. Uh, I strongly recommend, if you're interested in this topic, that you look at the Rice University drug charts. There's a Drug Policy Institute right here in Houston at Rice University, and that has some of the best data uh, I mean, it's data that is collected by the federal government, where the federal government every year collects survey data on about 120,000 uh, Americans uh, of all different ages to find out how many drugs are being used and what's the pattern of drug use. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, the, you, you can go to the federal government website, but it's not as user-friendly, and so that's why they, are, they make them more user-friendly here. And so it turns out that the evidence is quite clear, and this is some of the largest databases in the world for this. Uh, it turns out that the vast majority of drug use is, in fact, casual, occasional, non-problematic drug use. Uh, how many people are addicted to heroin in this country? Uh, and uh, there certainly is an increasing problem with all kinds of opioids, with unsafe use of opioids. But in terms of the actual percentage, now this was up until 2016, uh, was 0.3 percent of the uh, of the young adult population. You know, one of the that's one of the key ages for addiction is in your 20s because the brain is still developing and whatnot. Um, and by comparison, Portugal, before they decriminalized, was up to around 1% of the population using heroin or having used heroin, which is considered a huge, a huge percentage. Um, this is uh, a picture of the opium poppy flower itself. Uh, it's actually, there's actually a purely ornamental version of the flower. Um, and uh, opioids versus opiates, what's the difference? Well, uh, opioids includes, is the broader term that includes both natural and synthetic products. Uh, we have our own opioids, of course. Uh, every person here is producing opioids on a regular basis. If you twist your ankle and then after a while you find the pain subsiding, 
that's your own opioids that are attaching to the parts of the brain that govern pain perception. And that's why the external opioids have an effect on our brain, is because our brain is already set up to experience uh, pain reduction uh, and to a certain extent euphoria. Um, the opiates in the plant itself, the opium poppy plant, include opium, morphine, and codeine, and as we've discussed, bagels and muffins. Uh, when, when you eat, when you eat uh, a poppy seed bagel, that really is from the poppy seed, uh, from the poppy plant, uh, and yes, it does contain morphine, okay, if you, that's why I asked earlier, so 60% of you have had morphine in your bloodstream from eating a poppy seed bagel or poppy seed muffin, but don't worry, the amounts are, are tiny. Yes, it can cause a positive result on a drug test, okay, that's why you have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, and um, semi-synthetic semi uh, opioids include um, uh, heroin and oxycodone, that's where you take the morphine molecule itself from the poppy and then you modify it and create a different, uh, a different product. Uh, heroin, by the way, uh, was first created by uh, uh, Bayer Corporation. Fully synthetic products are methadone, fentanyl, and carfentanil. Uh, fentanyl and carfentanil, because they're so incredibly potent, are causing a lot of the overdose deaths um, these days. Um, a story of two latexes, I think I'll skip this because uh, I'm, I'm probably uh, over time anyway. Um, and uh, for medical opioids, are they safe or are they deadly? Well, a little bit of both. It's kind of like insulin. It's actually quite similar to insulin in the sense that um, if you're opioid naive, meaning you've never had opioids, or external opioids, then a high dose or even a moderate dose can be quite deadly because one of the effects of these drugs is that it reduces your respiratory drive. Uh, and then people stop breathing, and that's where the overdose deaths typically come from. But if it's increased slowly, uh, this, is, this is remarkable because there are very few medicines for, for which this is true. Uh, I remember once a few years ago, I had a, um, uh, a cancer patient come see me. Uh, now, I wasn't a cancer doctor. I was going to help her with other issues. She was already seeing a cancer doctor, and she had cancer all over her body. As is very common, she had a lot of pain. And she was already on fentanyl because her oncologist, her cancer doctor, had prescribed it. Um, and a month earlier, the cancer doctor had said, you need to increase your dose of fentanyl. Now, fentanyl, when it's increased slowly, there's a safe way to increase fentanyl dosage, uh, and it, it, it's quite safe. Uh, but she was afraid. Here she was with cancer all over her body and miserable, and she was afraid to increase the dose because I might get addicted. Uh, and so I increased her dose. I convinced her that it was okay. Uh, she wasn't going to suffer any harmful consequences, and she needed to increase her dose. And so we did that. Uh, so, but I decided before, I had used fentanyl once or twice before in my patients, in other words. Uh, and I decided to go back to the books, not that anybody uses books anymore, but I decided to go back to the references and review safe use of fentanyl in terms of increasing the dose appropriately. And I was reminded right there in the description of how to use fentanyl safely that there is no known upper dose limit. And this is true for opioids in general. In other words, when it's increased slowly, it's not clear. There probably is an upper dose limit, but because when it's increased slowly and you're under medical supervision, uh, it, it's a very, very safe uh, class of drugs. Obviously, if you're buying it on the street, as Dean Becker uh, often says in his radio show, um, you don't know what's in that bag. If you're buying it on the street and it's not regulated, then you have no idea what's in the bag, and it, and it may well contain fentanyl or carfentanyl, and that's where the deaths come from, is when people don't know what they're taking. Uh, fentanyl is, a, again, a synthetic uh, uh, opioid. Uh, we've talked about this. Uh, I remember with... Uh, some of my patients, well, with all my patients that use the fentanyl patch form of the medicine, uh, when they take it off, uh, because the people in their family or the people around them are likely to be opioid naive, and you can't just throw it in the trash can. There's a proper way to take it off, and then you fold it together so that the sticky parts are sticking together, uh, and a person who's opioid naive is less likely to be exposed to that very powerful 
um, form of the uh, medication, so you, there's a proper way to dispose of it. Uh, carfentanil, even more uh, powerful than fentanyl because it was quite literally designed to be used on elephants. When they call it the elephant tranquilizer, they're not kidding, okay? Uh, and that's why it has to be more powerful. Um, and that was first made by another drug company. Um, and um, here's some of the street names for some of the drugs. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure how many of them are real street names, but that's what I read on, that's what I read on the internet. Now, <laughs> opioid overdose, uh, 47,000 deaths in the USA in 2017, usually fentanyl, usually synthetic, usually um, uh, illegally produced fentanyl rather than medical fentanyl. Uh, opioid uh, in overdose causes uh, unresponsiveness or minimal responsiveness, slow breathing, tiny pupils, uh, and uh, the antidote is naloxone or Narcan, which you've heard about. Uh, there are different brands besides Narcan, but Narcan is the most uh, widely available and most, most uh, well-known form. It has to be given immediately. There's a nasal spray version of the medicine, uh, and uh, you can see the picture here. You just put your two fingers on there and your thumb, and you just squeeze it right into the nostril. It works extremely quickly. It basically go, goes to the same receptor, and its attachment to the receptor in the brain that the opioids are attached to is stronger than that of most opioids. And so it displaces the opioid, and the person wakes up immediately. They're not necessarily going to be happy with what you did, even though you saved their life, because now they're in immediate withdrawal. Um, and, uh, and that's just, uh, they're, they're, not liter they're not mad at you. This is physiologic. Right? Remember, because we talked about agitation being part of the withdrawal uh, picture. Uh, here's some of the different brands, and of course, the economics comes back into play. One of the brands of, uh, of an injection form of naloxone uh, is called uh, Evzio, uh, and that's a mere $3,800 <laughs> for two doses. Uh, now, it's, it's, it's a nice form because it's an auto-injector. You just put it on the thigh. Uh, and it basically injects itself. Only $3,800. Uh, and sober stands for son of a bitch, everything's real. Uh, that's after you've come out of recovery. Uh, and uh, so if you found yourself giggling, that was probably what we put into the coffee. Uh, now this is another fascinating thing. I, I, I think some of these studies that look at wastewater and surface waters, because I'm an environmentalist, are fascinating. This was a 2009 Minnesota study looking at what opioids are in our surface waters and wastewater, uh, and needless to say, there were quite a few of them, but the most commonly found ones were tramadol and dextromethorphan, which is a commonly used cough suppressant. Uh, you may have heard of Robitussin DM, so that's actually an opioid. So if you've had that one, uh, yeah, you, got, you guys are just a bunch of opioid users, I can tell. And uh, okay, so that's it. And I guess we can uh, take uh, questions at this point, so. Yeah, uh, we did go a little bit over on time, but we could probably do one question, right, Richard? You want to you pick a favorite of the hands? I, I will not. I'm going to have Josh pick the person. Uh. Oh, thanks. Um, well, the first one I saw was Patrick, so I'm going to hand this over. I was wondering if you could speak briefly to uh, some of the uses of uh, uh, psychedelics such as Ibocaine for treatment of uh, addiction to opioids. Well, I'm not an expert on the topic. I'm, uh, like you, I'm fascinated with the idea. There's been a great deal of uh, exploration of the use of hallucinogens, often remarkably low doses of hallucinogens under controlled circumstances to help with a variety of conditions, including depression, PTSD, uh, addiction itself. Again, I'm not an expert on that, but I, and I think we're relatively early uh, in terms of the science on that. Uh, but it, it's an example, perhaps, of where, when we get away from the hysteria surrounding drugs, we can start looking at ways in which they can be safely used uh, and in which they can be perhaps useful in some cases. And you can educate people about it uh, because they're open. In, Por in Portugal, for example, 
the, the drug user, the addict, will openly acknowledge that they're using or that they're having a problem because they know they're not going to go to prison. Uh, and, and then you, uh, right now we're basically guessing at who's a drug user and who's an addict and, and who's on the verge of overdosing. We're just guessing because they're not going to come out and admit it openly. So uh, thank you for the question. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Let's uh, thank Richard one more time. Thank you, Richard.